Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the fifth Sunday after Epiphany, which falls on February 4, 2024, are from Isaiah chapter 40, 21 through 31. The Psalm is 147, verses 1 through 11 and 20c. Our last reading in 1 Corinthians is chapter 9, 16 through 23, and the gospel reading is Mark 1, 29 through 39. Happy end of Epiphany. That's it's right. We're ending like the season with this one. Well, yeah, you know, you got, you got a little transfiguration, which I think counts for something. Well, yeah. I shift, never know what to right? do with transfiguration. It's it a, like a its bridge. Own... Bridge. Yeah, from, transition or something. Okay. From epiphany, which is to fitting, it. but uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so Mark one twenty nine through thirty nine. I uh, I love this passage in, and I was particularly moved by David Jacobson's commentary on the pointing out of Jesus' ministry is found in private spaces. Mm -hmm. I thought that, I immediately thought that that is a homiletical direction I would potentially Mm -hmm. take because I think, uh, especially in Epiphany, when uh, when there, the theme of course is manifestation and, and the revelation of Jesus ministry and who he is. And, and so it seems like so much of that is, uh, it, the assumption is a public kind of public kind of acts and presentations. And yet here we have Jesus entering into, uh, Simon's mother-in-law, you know, the home of Simon's mother-in-law and meets her in that in that private space and when she is ill and i thought that that promise of jesus that jesus is manifested or jesus is the you know the epiphanies of jesus are not always in these <laughs> grand public events uh, but are in these moments of deep need and these really intimate spaces and so how might how might one, how might a preacher pursue that as a homiletical direction and thinking, bringing up and coming to the close of Epiphany and thinking about that season and inviting people to imagine those Epiphany moments that are, that are intimate and that are, uh, and that are also perhaps scary or even uh, even deeply troubling. Uh, here she is set. And so where are those moments where, uh, yeah, what are those moments where Jesus is entering into those spaces I found to be really powerful this year? I was struck there as well, Caroline, with that, um, with uh, David bringing that up, uh, and um, it caught me in, in two ways. Um, one, for all of the ways that uh, I've been introduced to Mark, I think the thing that there are a couple of things that stick out. One is reading Mark and behind um, Isaiah, behind Exodus. You've heard me talk about that before. Uh, Ricky Watts' reading of uh, understanding what's happening in the gospel because you understand Israel's history, uh, which, as you were just describing, in some ways is that larger picture or that larger event of God's intrusion. Um, But what uh, struck me is I always pay attention to Mark's immediacy, and obviously we're going to talk about that, um, but I had not paid attention to this um, and both, both and, that uh, David has put pointing out, and you've just highlighted, public and private. I've done that with Luke. I've you've helped me do that with John. Um, that there, you know, whatever happens to someone who's named happens to someone who's not named, someone that is in great position, someone who is not. And then here it is in Mark, the public and the private. Uh, but what that caught for me was not to lose ourselves in the private. 
Um, uh, so I love your questions, and I think it's a great homiletical uh, pause uh, for preachers to invite our listeners to say, where is God showing up? But to not forget that God's showing up in that private is for the public. The healing of Simon's mother became her service for others. Um, that moment becomes a catalyst for the rest of the activity of Jesus and the disciples that will be described in Mark. So uh, those are the two things that struck me uh, in reading the passage uh, behind uh, uh, David's um, commentary. So I don't want to cause trouble. Go for it. But Go for it. <laughs> I wonder if we can qualify this a little bit and not use the words public and private because I think they um, I think they mean something differently to 21st century Western Ooh. folk than they would have then. Um, in other words, I, I want to use like maybe familial or residential instead of private um, because I worry that we assume, I don't think there were any private spaces in the first century the way we understand that today, yeah. private residential spaces. So if you've, folks who have been to Capernaum uh, and seen the the spot, the actual <laughs> building that has building. been from early on remembered as this as this place uh, is very, it's very tightly packed in with other places. And I don't think there's much that happens in anybody's home in first century Capernaum that their neighbors aren't fully aware of, you know? So it's it's a different kind of space than the, than the synagogue, absolutely. But I worry that, especially a lot of Americans hear private and think about being closed off yeah. from the world and their neighbors. Um, and, it, you know, of course, after this is done, right, uh, the whole village shows up. Which yeah. the, the whole city was gathered around the door, which is crazy because there's no way they could fit in because the, the streets or the the passageways are so tiny. But it's mm -hmm. it's this idea of this household in the midst of a larger social community or connectional place as well. That's it. And I don't want. I mean, some of this is like nitpicking over words, but I I do no. want no. people to get a sense for what kind of space that is. Just like synagogue space isn't like church space or holy space, the way we would understand it in the previous passage. That's also very public, very communal, very, um, I don't know, casual in the mm -hmm. sense of mm -hmm. this is where people gather to, to talk. Yeah, well, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think there's, an, I, there's a way to that Mark kind of, uh, as you mentioned, Joy, kind of uh, blurs, right, the, mm -hmm. the, those distinctions that we might make mm -hmm. or our, the assumptions that we might make with what you said in terms of the whole city was gathered around the door and, and then he cured many who were sick with various diseases. And so then you think, then you look at the response of Simon's mother-in-law, that she began to serve them, and which is the same verb, of course, we've pointed this out, the same verb that's used for the angels, for Jesus in the wilderness. And it's, to, and it's the way that Jesus will describe his own ministry coming to the end of his public ministry, I came not to be served, but to serve in 1045. And so the way in which, uh, the way in which she, she is, emblematic or she is she is uh, symbolic or or even acts out embodies Jesus own ministry and so then to one extent is, as she does it so also will all the other people who are healed and so that that service becomes a potential response to uh to that to that healing touch of Jesus and so there's this there's this immediate right wider, reality of this um, intimate moment uh, or this moment, maybe we can say it's a moment just for her uh, and that, but has, has ripples of repercussions. Um, but I don't want to take away that moment for her. I think that's where mm -hmm. I'm kind of mm -hmm. going with that is mm -hmm. that 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, it, with the private and the public, but it's a moment. It's, it's directly for her, and then the also the intimacy of took, taking her by the hand and lifting her up, uh, and then the way in which then her activity or her response then becomes almost immediately <laughs> for the entire the way the entire town could could uh, respond, which then also means the way in which the way in which Mark one fifteen is already coming true of mm. the kingdom of God mm. has come near, has come repent near. And in the gospel, you know, that the king, the time has been fulfilled. It's already, you know, it's the, uh, the activity of Jesus, the, mm, the, the essential ministry of Jesus as service is already happening. Oh, if that makes yeah. sense. Does that, does that mm. make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's really important. I think it's it, it gets at the idea of what does it mean for him to proclaim the kingdom of God, mm-hmm. which isn't apparently, um, hey, you're all forgiven. Apparently it's not, hey, all you have to do is have faith. You know, it's much more, there's a bigger thing going on there. Mm-hmm. And it's not just in what he speaks, but it's in what he does. So, mm-hmm. you know, he says, let's go out into the neighborhood towns and I proclaim there also. But then what he does, he proclaims and he casts out demons. So he's still like, kind of doing, doing stuff. And so it's a, you know, it's that language we use all the time, kingdom of God, and don't really know what it means. And we're not comfortable with the language, obviously, for a number of reasons about uh, um, the way king is gendered and and what even a kingdom is. And so, but it's, and especially paired with Isaiah 40, you know, it gives us an opportunity to talk about this idea of the divine power that resides in this kingdom, this basileia, this reign. And it's about, like you said, it's about health. It's about these individual connections that have these ripple effects. Um, and so I think it too, when he, when he heals everybody who comes um, and casts out many demons, I, I doubt that's just with a wave of the hand saying, hey, by the way, you all are healed too. I, 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 I hope that the story of the, the possession in the synagogue and now Simon's mother-in-law sets us up to imagine all of these are like Mm. face-to-face, one-on-one kinds of experiences for folks because there's a new norm. There's a new power. Power is maybe not the right word to use for reign or realm or whatever this is that's going on, but, and it's a realm of wholeness and of connection. That was a good segue to Isaiah 40. That was well, well. That was. Uh, I'd like to say that was totally intentional. <laughs> <laughs> you Sometimes know, I stumble on to connecting text. Usually, I just muddle around here. Uh, beautifully done in the in uh, both in how we were talking about these actions in Mark, or particularly how you did this, Matt. Uh, Jesus is doing, which becomes the proclamation the experience, individuals and collectively, of this um, good, uh, of this healing, uh, makes true what is going to be spoken. Um, It's not just a promise, but it actually has happened and it is now explained, that the reality is articulated. And the Isaiah text, in one way, uh, beginning as we do here in in the middle of this this fortieth uh, chapter, um, says, "This is what's always been happening. Haven't you heard this? Don't you know this? This same God who um, delivered Israel and then gave these words of how to live a life that will be." demonstrative of the reign of God, the Ten Commandments. This story of the creator God and this intention of the world to be good, to work, to function, these are the stories you've heard all along. Um, And so now let's turn our attention to who is this God. Um, Yeah, I I I think there's a definite tie. that that can be brought out uh, in the preaching moment of these texts. Isaiah 42 is also about, right, it's about power and empire. I mean, the, in mm-hmm. terms of the context here, right, this is now in the, in the wake of the defeat of the Babylonians and a new reality now 
dawning for people in exile and a prophet saying, go, God is so eager to bless you. God is so eager to give strength and to restore now the nation. And so that's also, I wonder if that could be carried forward and how we might put this in conversation with Mark chapter one as well. It's not just that Jesus has come to be nice or to connect people in ways they hadn't thought of before, but it's this new well, what does it say in the in the synagogue in our chapter from last week, our passage from last week, right? A new teaching with authority. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, these things come to be. And so there's this power as well in, um, well, it doesn't use the expression word of the Lord here. I don't believe in Isaiah 40, but the, a similar kind of, of, of rule or reign that results in life and rebirth and wholeness. Well, oh, yeah, and I I think the the particularly the language toward the end of the passage of he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak, uh, and uh, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings. You know that that uh, rather familiar passage. Uh, they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Uh, is a, I think also a lovely connection to. Uh, to the magnitude of Jesus healing and and that that feeling of feeling of that you know one on one connection with Jesus and the uh, and that healing moment of what of of what it means to have that you know that weariness and tiredness and strength renewed whether that's and how and particularly as that is brought about. Um, you know, brought about by sickness or something along those lines. But I, I just think, um, yeah, there's, I would, I would use some of that language too, of, of, of lifting up the weary and lifting up the tired and, and how you can think about that, not just, not just from a literal perspective, but also just a metaphorical, imaginative perspective of, you know, what, uh, going back to what you were talking about, Matt, about what does wholeness look like? What does wholeness feel like? And that healing is, is not, not only that healing of the physical, but healing of the, of the spirit and how that, how that, how that feels in body, mind, and spirit. I think that could be something I, I might explore. The um, context you put this in, Matt, um, of the defeat of the Babylonians. Uh, you don't get the context from reading Isaiah 39, because so much actually happens in Israel's history between chapter 39, uh, before the exile, and chapter 40, when in the midst of exile, they are being reminded, don't why are you calling out that as if God has forgotten you? Why are you complaining? Um, and Caroline, this fits with what you were saying. Isn't that exactly our position when things aren't going the way that we desire for them to go, when we are sick, when uh, we've lost our job, when uh, the economy fails us, when politicians fail us, when the church fails us, when our family and friends fail us? You fill in the blank. Our response is to complain. And the difficulty of this good word is it comes with a, why are you complaining? Don't you know this? That's why we gather every week to tell these stories again, so that we never forget that this is the work that God has been doing from the beginning, in the midst of our failure, in the midst of our going in the wrong direction, God has not stopped being faithful to give us the promise of what has uh, been the intention from creation, that the one who stretched out the heavens wants everything to be good. And that means that we will work, we will function, it will be the way it is supposed to do. And the way it is, is that We'll have the strength. We'll, um, we won't grow tired. We will keep the capacity. We will have the capacity to keep hope. And, uh, and so we will soar. Uh, 
just a paraphrase of those same verses that you lifted out for us, Caroline. Yeah, and if we need another reminder, you've got one Psalm 147, which we'll yeah. tell us again, this time in lyrical form. So, <laughs> yeah. Which again connects this to uh, a, a God with not just power as in brute strength, right? But even this connection to the stars um, and knowing their number and calling them by name, which I, I think means something really different to me now, post uh, <laughs> web telescope, than it did a couple of years ago. Um, to imagine the magnitude of that, but then to see that that matters now for this <clears throat> this group of exiles uh, in Israel, and then in a way it applies as well, of course, to um, Simon's mother-in-law, and applies as well to us in its own way. Yeah, and 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 it, since you brought in uh, Psalm one forty seven, it's that same thing that this God who knows the stars so that none is missing heals heals the brokenhearted. And we talk about mm -hmm. the the healing, so binding up their wounds. Okay, I'm I'm thinking physical when I read this part, but in the context of the brokenhearted, those are the wounds you can't see. Those are the traumas that go unnoticed by so many. Um, and God, as as this God is concerned about all the stars, so God is concerned about all of those hidden horrors. I'd be way more distracted by the stars if I were God. I'd be way more into playing with those. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I can't resist now. I resist it when you did it the first time you were talking about now with the with the um with the telescope. But um as you guys know, in the summer I've been able to go to Outlaw Ranch in South Dakota. And uh a couple of years ago when I was there, I accidentally got this wonderful picture. Um you know, away from the city. I'm all, you know, I've always been in the city. Um, and so away from the city, I could get this picture of the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper in one shot against this, you know, midnight blue sky. It took the picture. I was so proud of it. And I showed it to the folks that were around and they went, oh, wow, look, you got the Milky Way. And I went, where? Because <laughs> I had never <laughs> seen in with my natural eye, the milky. So I had no idea that what I thought was a smudge on the picture <laughs> was right. actually yeah, I this. I wipe my lens off. Yeah, <laughs> was actually. So yeah, I get you. I, I would be much more yeah. attentive to the stars, and obviously, God, obviously is. There's a beautiful image in there somewhere, right? Like you know. I would be intimidated by the nuclear reactions, whatever you're working on with stars, right? What does it take to heal a, a broken heart, right? Or to mend, uh, to bind up a wound and th that kind of uh, intimacy and it's embedded in that image too. And it, for me, it also, it takes me back to the gospel reading as well, because it, you not just Simon's mother-in-law, but all the people around her who are experiencing that broken heartedness of being beside someone who's ill and, and so it's not not only the person who's healed, but the persons around them who experience experience that healing, and their hearts are healed in that healing as well. And uh, and how loss is averted, and uh, and so that's another that's another piece of that as well that I find really moving. Well, uh, yeah, to know how serious a fever could be in an ancient yeah. Yeah. setting. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. My mother would have said, well, I've had a fever all the time and I worked through it. But yeah, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's just my mother who never missed a day of work as far as I remember. <laughs> but different thing. Work-life balance, people. All right. Your, your mother got <laughs> fevers. <laughs> she never my admitted mom never it, got yeah. sick. <laughs> I think even when it, and even with a fever, I think I still had to go to church. I don't know what was the threshold of, <laughs> I don't know what was the threshold of when I didn't have to go to church, but it was pretty high. Probably 103.5 or something but, like that. No, I think it had to be at like 105 and I was hallucinating <laughs> and I couldn't go to church. <laughs> I, then I didn't have to go to church. Otherwise, yeah, I had to be there in my Sunday best. <laughs> if the doctor wasn't right, holding Christians, you locked up. Yeah. Now, <laughs> for me, this First Corinthians, uh, I was trying to think of. I wanted to transition when we were when we were talking about Isaiah because it talks about the proclamation 
uh, or even when we were looking at, uh, at at Mark in terms of what happens after this healing has happened, what happens after you've seen a miracle, even if you haven't experienced it, then you have to tell somebody. And this, this is, this is what I'm, I'm catching here is that, um, the compelled to preach, uh, that Paul is, is expressing here and that it is in this, that, um, Paul, it is at this point that Paul makes this statement that fits all the way back to how we were, how we opened to talk about the gospel. And that is recognizing the diversity of people, uh, recognizing the diversity of situations. Um, so to become, um, like one who mm-hmm. doesn't have the law, even though I have the law to become, um, to become what is needed in the context, uh, to speak so that the hearer can understand before they've learned your language. And I, th- I think if, if we're not, if, well, either First Corinthians is uh, a lesson for us as we prepare to preach the other texts, or if we preach this portion of First Corinthians, that we attend to the generosity that Paul is describing here, uh, the humility of saying, I'm going to find a way to give this good news, not in a way that makes me look good, but in a way that it can be received in uh, the easiest way that you might be able to understand just how good it is. Yeah, I like the way you use the word generosity there, Joy, that, that this is a passage that sometimes is taken as, what should we be doing? Right. And I have to imagine Paul would say, well, the first thing you got to do is is listen right. <laughs> or or tend to the other, because this is in the context of that discussion about idol meat and mm-hmm. And not just tolerating, but deeply respecting other people's consciences, and which, which, which what this you know is born out of. And so, it's not a strategy for mission like it sometimes is taken out. Like first and foremost, it's a theological statement about what does it really mean to recognize the gospel as a gospel for everybody as they are and who they are. And if you if you skip over Where that they and are. jump to how do we be more relevant? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think too, on a on a purely not necessarily a, a preaching the specificity of preaching this passage, but also for the preacher to it's another way for the preacher to think about uh for herself this the importance of context in preaching and mm-hmm. how do we imagine what how do we, how do we imagine the way in which we attend to our context. And so this is a, I think this becomes a way for people or for preachers to reflect on that in maybe a different kind of way. Uh, we, we talk about knowing your context and knowing what they need to hear, but how do we, how do we think of it along the lines of Paul too, and this generosity and being what they, being what they, not just listening and what they need to hear, but also how is it that we are being who they are um, in our in our preaching and the way in which that casts a different perspective and understanding of contextuality in preaching. Mm-hmm.